Thank you for the welcome. It's good to be here. The psalmist says in Psalm 147, Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praise to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Well, we have God's word and we're going to turn to God's word now. The Old Testament reading is Psalm 122. A song of ascents. It's a psalm of David. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord. According to the statutes given to Israel, there stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. So reads the word of God. Well, we have Old and New Testament. We've read from the Old. Let's go to the New. Let's go to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13 to 28. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and that, they, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some 
who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So read the word of God. You may well be tired already of uh, hearing or watching bits and pieces about the election that takes place on Thursday. We need to pray about it and uh, we need to know about it, but we don't need perhaps to listen to all the stuff that comes across about it. Apparently, 2024 will be the biggest election year in history with more than 60 countries representing half the world's population going to the polls. That's quite staggering, isn't it? Now that uh, information came in, in a little tract called The Cross That Counts by an evangelist called Roger Carswell. You might have heard of Roger Carswell. He's a lovely guy and a great preacher of the gospel. He's produced this little tract. And of course, it's not really about the election. The cross that counts is the cross of the Lord Jesus. And uh, when I got just a few spares of this leaflet, they're probably about seven, and if there are seven, well, if you want one afterwards, you can have one to read because it's well written. But the challenge also is, if you like it, give it away. You know, if you know the Lord Jesus, you want to share the gospel, and this is a way of doing it. And uh, it's a good thing to do. The trouble is with human elections in this country or elsewhere, all sorts of manifestos are, are given, all sorts of plans are brought before us, all sorts of promises made, but I'm old enough now to know that often what they say they can't or don't or won't keep. And uh, it's, it's not a job I would do, being a politician, we need to pray for them. There are some Christians in Parliament, we need to pray especially for them, because that's quite a challenge. But I'm not going to go down the road of uh, politics tonight, though it, it does matter, and the Bible says certain things about that, but uh, I want to give you a manifesto, a policy, a statement of the Lord Jesus Christ that is guaranteed. And it is given us in five words in Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 18. This is what Jesus said. Here are the five words. I will build my church. You got it? If you forget all I say tonight, remember those words of the Lord Jesus who said, I will build my church. And we're going to consider those words of the Lord Jesus, that statement that he made just briefly this evening. We live in days when the church in our country is often in decline. I read some kind of a report about the decline and disintegration of the UK church. That's discouraging, isn't it? And someone said that uh, half the country's population identify as Christian, but only 6% are practising Christian, and they only go once a month. Well, again, that's gloomy, isn't it? And decline in attendance apparently is one reason why over 2,000 churches have closed during the last decade. Well, that may be so, but Jesus said, I will build my church. He built his church. And that we'll think about for a little while this evening. <coughs> Five words. Five points. Makes it easy to remember, doesn't it? Okay. First, notice the person who speaks. It is the Lord Jesus. He said, I will build my church. You remember he's with the disciples. Now at Caesarea Philippi, there's conversation going on. And the Lord Jesus says, who do people say I am? And the disciples are there together and, and they come back with some, some suggestions. Why? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Interesting. Then Jesus, you know, just turns up the heat a bit and says, uh, 
And who do you say that I am? He's addressing the disciples. And Peter, their spokesman, comes out with this tremendous answer in verse 16. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a remarkable statement Peter makes. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus says, well, that didn't come from human flesh, man's cleverness. No, that was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And then the Lord Jesus goes on to say to Peter, Peter, whose name is a stone or a small rock, Peter, he says, you are a rock or a stone, and on this rock, large rock, solid rock, I will build my church. He wasn't saying, the Lord Jesus wasn't saying that the church was built on Peter. Notice that, you read a bit later, and the Lord Jesus says to Peter, verse 23, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block. But it's what Peter said that's the rock. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter, revealed by God to him, speaks out about who Jesus is. He is the rock. There is no other. And he says, I will build my church. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, born the first Christmas. But Jesus existed from eternity, the son of God. Jesus, who came into this world for our sakes, this is who speaks here, the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised one, the anointed one, the Messiah, who is the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the person who speaks. Think about who he is, but think about what he did as well. You see what happened after the Lord Jesus talks to the disciples uh, about the church. He then goes on to tell them that, in fact, he is going to die, verse 21. He speaks, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. That's what he came to do. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He came to die for our sakes, to bear away our sin and to rise again victorious. And uh, why did he do so? Well, we know, don't we? John 3, 16, you'll know by heart, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Or as the apostle Paul puts it in Galatians 2, 20, when he refers to the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The only people Jesus came to save are sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, says the Apostle Paul, of whom I am the worst. The trouble is with most people today, they don't see themselves as sinners and they see themselves as not too bad really. And they'll say, well, I live a decent life. I, I uh, get on with other people. I support charities. I do good things. I don't cause any harm. But the word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's why Jesus came, to save sinners. And it's the Saviour who speaks here. So the challenge first really is, have you come to him? Are you trusting him as Saviour? Have you come in repentance and faith to him, owning up to your sin and seeking his forgiveness and cleansing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, says the word of God, and you will be saved. So that's the person who speaks. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Notice, secondly with me, 
the promise he makes. I will build my church. What a promise this is. It's a promise for the success of the church. It's not, I might build my church, but I will build my church. And that's tremendous. And there are many promises in the word of God and we can trust them because God keeps his promises. Joshua 21, 45 says, Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. And writing to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 20, the apostle declares, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. How many promises has God made? How many promises do you know? Or can you quote? You know, we, we know some, don't we? You know, we, we know that the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise, isn't it? Or Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need. That's a promise, isn't it? Well, someone has counted, not me, Someone has counted there are 7,487 promises in the Bible. Have you got nothing to do? Get your Bible and start and underline each one. Rich promises, precious promises. We know so few. We need to know more. So the Lord Jesus says, I will build my church. We, of course, sometimes make statements that we will do, but we don't always keep them, do we? I will be there, but if you miss the bus, maybe you won't be there. You know, we make these statements with good intentions, but we don't always, we're not always able to keep them. Sometimes, sadly, we make promises we've no intention of keeping. It's just to get somebody off our backs who's after something or whatever. But when the Lord Jesus speaks, he speaks the truth because his word is the truth because he himself is the truth. Did he not say, I am the way, the truth and the life? No one comes to the Father but by me. We can trust his promises. And that's tremendous. I will build. Notice thirdly, the process he uses, I will build my church. I'm not an expert on building, though I've, I love to watch buildings going up and, and uh, in churches that we've been involved in, 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 in the goodness of God, we've seen buildings added or extended or church halls built alongside. And it's, it's fascinating. Of course, you're going to build, you've got to have plans, first of all, haven't you? And uh, the, the book you're holding, the Bible, gives you God's plans, does it not? It's God's word. It's God's blueprint for us. And then surely the uh, building needs a foundation. It's sad, isn't it, when uh, buildings are put on shaky foundations. Sometimes you hear stories of buildings that collapse because they've not been built on a solid foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, we're told concerning the church, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. He is the sure foundation. And uh, hearing him and obeying him means we're building on rock. You will know well, you learned in Sunday school probably, you know, that the uh, story Jesus told, which has got a chorus kids used to sing, about the two builders, one who built on the rock and one who built on the sand. What was the secret of building on the rock? The secret was this. Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice 
He's like a man who builds his house on the rock. Whoever hears these words and does not put them into practice, it's like a man who builds on the sand. And you know the outcome. You need the right foundation. And it's the Lord Jesus who is and who speaks that sure foundation. There are plans, there's a foundation needed, and there is real growth needed. Growth in two ways, in a sense. Growth in numbers being added to the church and growth in the lives of individuals in the church. How much growth is going on in these days? Well, around the world there is growth in numbers. There are parts of the world where God in his grace has saved many, many people. We were listening a bit last night um, on YouTube to an account of the Welsh Revival, 1904-05. And uh, there in Wales, beginning in a place called Loha, where a man called Evan Roberts was used of God to preach the gospel in the power of the Spirit of God and many hearts and lives were changed and the revival that took place there spread not just in Wales, but in England and other parts of the world to thrilling reading. Makes you want to think, well, I wish I'd been there in those days to have seen it and heard it and been caught up with it. Because in this country, generally, we live in a, a day of small things when not much is happening. Actually, we've just spent a, a holiday in, in Wales, in Port Maddock, and driving around Wales today, they're not building churches all too often. They're either knocking them down or selling them off for warehouses or converting them into country cottages. That's sad. That's sad, but that's happening. But that's not the case in other parts of the world where the church is growing. So we need to pray for growth, for the Lord to build his church, but not just in terms of numbers coming to Christ, though we long to see that, but in terms of us being built together. In Ephesians 2, 21, we read of Christ, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Is that happening among us in these days? 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. We are to be those who grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Are you still an infant Christian, or are you growing up into maturity? and godliness and holiness that glorifies the Lord and is a blessing to others. Next time you see a building going up somewhere around here and you look at what's happening, remember that. Let it be a reminder of what the Lord is doing in these days. I will build my church, is what he says. He builds. It's the work of his spirit as people are one for Christ and grow in grace as they become more like Jesus. And then the fourth word here, I will build my church. Here is the possession he declares. It is his. It belongs to him. We sometimes talk about my church. That's my church, and that's his church, and I understand that. I do it myself, no doubt time to time, but actually it's not mine at all or yours. The true church is his. I will build my church. It belongs to Christ. If you own your own house, do you remember the day when you, you signed up for a mortgage to buy it? Or if you've got a big enough bank balance when you put the pound notes on the table and bought it outright? You signed up, you got the deeds, it was yours. You purchased it. Jesus said, I will build my church, it's his, because he purchased it. 
the price he paid. Ephesians 5.25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Or Romans 5 verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty for our sin. Or 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. What a price. The precious blood of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the price, bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. I will build my church. See the price he pray, paid and the presence he enjoys. He indwells his people by his spirit. What was his parting promise to the disciples before he ascended up into heaven? That's it, you're on your own, not a bit of it. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He lives with his people, Ephesians 3.17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Do you know his presence? Are you walking with him? Are you stirred by his spirit? Are you feeding on his word? Are you fellowshipping with your brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus? He's with us. Even a, a small company, isn't it true? Did he not say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Isn't that amazing? By his spirit, he's with all of his people all of the time. We belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. My church. I will build my church. So, fifthly, the people he chooses. I will build my church. Now notice the term that's used here, translated church. It's different to the one we normally use when we're talking about the church because we're often talking about a building. A few years ago, Barbara and I received a, a, an invitation to go to a wedding at St. Paul's Cathedral. Wow. And we thought, well, goodness, been invited to a wedding there. It was a bit high security. You had a pass to get in or whatever, and uh, actually it wasn't in the main part of St. Paul's, but one of the chapels anyway. And we only got there because the bridegroom... Um, his dad was, I think it was an OBE or an MBE, and uh, they get that privilege of having their family married at a place like St Paul's. Spectacular building. It took my mind back to when I was a lad and we lived on the edge of London, going up to St Paul's and going up into the Whispering Gallery, if you've been up there. And I don't think we got to the Golden Gallery, which was right at the top, but uh, it's quite a building. Spectacular building. There are pictures, aren't there, of it being spared during the Second World War and it remains intact, does it not? But it's only a building and we need to remember that. Lovely buildings they may be, they were built for the glory of God, but they're not the church, they're the church building. And if the building's blown up, the church still exists because... The term that's used here, I will build my church, it comes from the Greek word, which means the called out of, those called out of. Translated sometimes the assembly, or a nice word, the congregation. Not bricks and mortar, but men and women, young people, girls and boys, who've been saved by the grace of God, who are trusting the Lord Jesus who come in repentance and faith to him. Says the apostle in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9, you are God's building. Or Colossians 1 18, 
He, Christ, is the head of the body, the church. People who belong to Christ. The church is made up of individuals. That's the teaching of this term that we have here. There's the picture of the body, isn't there? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So we belong to one another in the Lord Jesus. We have different functions, different responsibilities, different opportunities, different gifts, but part of the body, part of the building, part of the true church, the Lord Jesus Christ. What's your place? What's your purpose? What are you doing in the service of the Saviour among, with and through his people? The true church is the entire body of Christ, local and universal, says Bishop Ryle commenting, the blessed company of all faithful people the body of believers of every age and tongue and people. The church militant, that's down here. There's a battle going on, isn't there? We're to fight the good fight of the faith. The church triumphant, that's heaven. And one day, by the grace of God, we shall be there. John's vision in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. He gets this glimpse into glory. Think about this. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, with palm branches in that's a great picture of heaven, the church complete, the church triumphant, the church with Christ in glory for all eternity. The church secure. Bishop Ryle makes the comment, no member of the true church will ever be cast away. Didn't the Lord Jesus say in John 10, 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that great? I could never save myself. Jesus came to save me. I could never keep going in the Christian life by myself. But the Lord Jesus is with me to enable me. I would never get to heaven by myself. But the Lord Jesus has gone to prepare a place for me because I belong to him. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus said, I will build my church. And you can rest assured of that. So how do you respond to that? Well, I hope, first of all, you're encouraged by that. That's tremendous. In a day and age when all sorts of things fail and don't get very far, even the best intentions, here is God's guarantee for us. I will build my church, says the Lord Jesus. So we should be encouraged. We should be challenged by that. Secondly... Why? Because we need to be the people that we're meant to be. We need, by the grace of God, to live godly lives, to reflect something of the Lord Jesus. When I was a boy at grammar school, we were expected in school days, when we were out and about, to wear our school uniform. In those days, it was a peak cap and a school tie and the right coloured blazer. And if you were seen out of school without your uniform on, you could be in trouble. We don't hang a uniform up when we go out the door of church, do we? No, no. Wherever we go, whoever we meet, whatever is happening... We are to commend the Lord Jesus Christ. It shall be clear that we belong to him by the lives that we live, by the words that we speak, by the way we behave, like Jesus. That's a challenge, isn't it? And the challenge also is that we might, like the Lord Jesus, spread the good news about him to others while there is still time. 
Jesus said, I will build my church. Amen.